Welcome to Live from the Grand Teton Music Festival from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I'm Donald Ronicles, the music director of the festival. The festival takes place in the Teton Mountains of Wyoming. The festival orchestra consists of the finest orchestral players from more than 90 orchestras around the world. The international audience is unique. They may hike, bike, or sightsee during the day, but they also come to Jackson for the evenings for some of the finest music making anywhere, the Grand Teton Music Festival. Joining me here today is my friend and co-host, Jeff, Jeff Cairns. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Donald. It's so good to be with you. Each year we're now presenting a staged opera to conclude our festival this eighth week. This last season was no exception as we presented Giacomo Puccini's Madama Butterfly. Jeff, in the words of Anna Maria Martinez, our butterfly for this production, this is a, a difficult story, but a story that must be told, for it is still relevant today, unquote. What an interesting comment to make. She has sung this around the world with great, great success. What do you think provoked this comment? Two things. The fact that this opera is somewhat controversial, given its cultural appropriation issues, but also the fact that opera, all opera, all performing arts really, speak not only about their time, but all times. Operas are translatable across centuries, and this one certainly is as well. So the larger themes of love, loyalty, cruelty are worth talking about in anyone's time, not just Puccini's. Some of that is wrapped up in what was happening in Europe at the time that he wrote this. We're talking about the turn of the last century when European artists were fascinated with exoticism. I say that in quotes. And part of that fascination dealt with fetishizing cultures like Asian cultures. And the stereotypes that were commonly displayed in these works were often misogynistic, often focusing on female passivity that's certainly present in this piece. But I think the overarching themes of loyalty, imperialism, love in its real and false states, I think carry through this music and through this story in a way that deserves discussion today. So I think she's commenting about both. There are some people who think operas like this shouldn't be performed because of the potential controversies embedded in their creation. But I agree with Anna Maria that the baseline message of this story mm -hmm. is still worth telling. I mean, do you agree this piece has its detractors, but you aren't among them, and I think you might feel the same way she does? I think this piece does have its detractors. I think all of what you've just said is extremely important. It is still relevant today. I think being sensitive to some people's sensitivities to the subject puts the onus on us or puts the onus on any opera company putting on this work to be sensitive to that, also in the way in which it's depicted, quite literally also in the way people are made up in the costumes and the sets. And there are some very, very creative ways of telling this very important story, but at the same time not falling into the trap of, particularly if Madame Butterfly is not Japanese, how do you portray a Japanese woman? At the same time, this Japanese woman on some level is an archetype for many countries. I'm always fascinated with the fact that when this opera was composed, when it first came out in 1904, this coincided with this incredible imperialistic thrust of America, 1898, the Philippines, 1899, Teddy Roosevelt, this feeling of stretching further than our, I'm talking about the United States, of course, our boundaries, and quite literally with these imperialistic thoughts, bringing Christianity to countries or a variety of things. The fact that this is central to the story, of course, this American sailor, this battleship, this coming together with this very, very young Japanese woman, even then, on some level, I think people must have been thinking about this. Having said that, it's also, I think, important that we continue to tell this story because, as you know, we all need stories. It starts from when you're very, very young. We learn about values, we learn about cultures, we learn about diversity through stories. Even as we're getting older, of course, we can read history books to read about these cultural situations, social, political situations. But when 
this compelling story is before us when the lights go down and you're transported to this this world this very different world to ours when the subject matter and when the message of that story is what we read about in history books it compels us to continue to perform these works even though at that time they weren't necessarily thought of as small p political operas I'm glad you mentioned imperialism because I do think that theme runs through this music still. And I think you're right about what was happening back at that time in America and elsewhere. And I think if nothing else, it's worth continuing to confront ourselves with the idea that there was at one time a moment where it seemed possible, if not okay, at least possible, to buy a home that came with a wife in a faraway land and then abandon both for versions back home. That's worth considering and thinking about and reckoning with. You mentioned all the versions of this piece that Puccini went through. There were five of them, if I recall. The premiere actually didn't go very well for this piece, did it? He had some issues. He had just come off of two huge successes Bohem in 1896, Tosca in 1900, but the premiere for Butterfly did not go well. He had his detractors in the audience, and they booed, and they hissed, and they made cat calls. His Butterfly had a bit of a wardrobe malfunction that got a bunch of laughs from people. He was having his own personal issues at the time. This was not like a positive experience for Puccini at the very beginning, but it got better, and this piece now is not only standard repertory, but really beloved, isn't it? I defy anybody, including myself, (laughs) to experience the last 10 minutes searingly, heart-rendingly, passionate and intense and tragic without a very large lump in one's throat. We might one day find the forum. What did that mean to you? Yeah. Of course, beautiful music, beautiful singers, great set. But what else? What do you take with you in terms of the inherent tragedy of this work? And that's the beauty of music, isn't it? That from the very outset of Madame a Butterfly, regardless of what people are perhaps thinking on stage, we, the listeners, have this commentary, this musical commentary, not in words but in music, but you can already sense early on the foreboding, this feeling of this is not going to end well. And that's always something I would love to know more about from young to old members of our audience. What is it that they take with them? And it's not so much, will you listen to this piece again? I hope it's, I didn't know opera could transport me in this way. Are there actually, in such an opera as Madame a Butterfly, are there other issues that just begin to work on you? One of the great things about opera is that the story doesn't have to do all the work. You just mentioned the music. How does the music of Butterfly in your mind stack up to that of Bohème and Tosca, both of which you also know very well? I should imagine it was a, a singular challenge for Puccini to conjure up this delicate, beautiful Japanese world, the customs of Japan, so foreign to the then Americans arriving. In some ways, as foreign as it is today to us. I think he must have given great thought about how do I musically conjure up the world of Japan and of course he must have known a lot about traditional instruments, Japanese instruments he does very much establish that we are not in New York we are not in Rome (laughs) we are not anywhere really with which we're familiar we are in this world of Japan did he study Japanese music? it would have been very hard to because as you know in the 19th century it was such a closed off society it was this black hole in the sense it didn't let any light out it didn't let any information about itself out he writes stupendous music which I think in many ways was something of a trailblazer in terms of film composers and other composers wanting to portray this very beautiful and very traditional Japanese world yeah I think he had a huge influence on everybody who came after him And when you compare that with, back to your question, with Tosca, in Tosca, you are in the church. You are outside. You are experiencing dawn. You have this feeling you are in this ancient and storied city, Rome, this world of intrigue, 
this world of jealousy in Madame and Butterfly. There's no sentiment of jealousy, the tyranny of power, if you like, that one has in Tosca. And they inhabit two entirely different worlds, and yet they're so unmistakably Puccini in all its glory and voluptuous sound. That's one of the interesting things about Butterfly for me is that there is no Scarpia. There's no really cut-and-paste villain in this story. Pinkerton is that to a degree, but he's not Scarpia. It's not the same kind of bad guy that we're dealing with in this case. So I think there's a lot of subtlety that's required from Puccini in the score and in the storytelling. Yes, anecdotally, it might amuse some listeners to know that there are certain roles, operatic roles, where if you're not booed, you're doing something wrong. (laughs) And that sounds utterly perverse. No, I know what you mean. But Pinkerton coming on at the very end, inevitably, some boos. Not the person, not the singer, of course not the singer, but the character. This flawed, arrogant, immature character. Absolutely. The witch comes on at the end of Hansel and Gretel. Oh! You know, chosen performances. The place erupts with boos. <laughs> Other circumstances, that would just be career-ending, but sometimes it actually helps people's careers. Donald, let's take a little break, and after the break, we'll come back and give our listeners a brief synopsis of the story, at least the part of it that we will tell, Act One of Madame Butterfly. You're listening to Live from the Grand Tita Music Festival. I'm Donald Runnicles. And I'm Jeff Counts. Donald, let's tell everyone what happens in Act 1. I'll start. We're in Japan at the turn of the 20th century. Lieutenant Benjamin Franklin Pinkerton of the U.S. Navy inspects a house overlooking Nagasaki Harbor that he is leasing from Goro, a local marriage broker. The house comes with three servants and a wife named Chocho-san, known locally as Madam Butterfly. The lease runs for 999 years, subject to monthly renewal. The American consul Sharpless arrives breathless from climbing the hill. Pinkerton describes his philosophy of the fearless Yankee roaming the world in search of experience and pleasure. He's not sure whether his feelings for the young girl are love or a whim, but he intends to go through with the wedding ceremony. Sharpless warns him that the girl may view the marriage differently, but Pinkerton brushes off such concerns and says that someday he will take a real American wife. He offers the consul whiskey and proposes a toast. Butterfly arrives with her friends for the ceremony. In casual conversation after the formal introduction, Butterfly admits her age, 15, and explains that her family was once prominent but lost its position, and she has had to earn her living as a geisha. Her relatives arrive and chatter about the marriage. Butterfly shows Pinkerton her few possessions and quietly tells him that she has been to the Christian mission and will embrace her husband's religion. The imperial commissioner reads the marriage agreement and the relatives congratulate the couple. Suddenly, a threatening voice is heard from afar. It is the Bonze, Butterfly's uncle, who is a priest. He curses the girl for going to the mission, the Christian mission, and rejecting her ancestral religion. Pinkerton orders them, outraged, to leave. And as they go, the Bonze and the shocked relatives denounce Butterfly. Pinkerton tries to console Butterfly with sweet words. Her friend Suzuki helps her into her wedding kimono before the couple meets in the garden where they make love. All the makings of a tragedy, for sure. For this performance of Madame Butterfly, we have Ana Maria Martinez as our Chocho-san, Christopher Oglesby sings Pinkerton, Boo, Megan Marino is Suzuki, Thomas Lehman is Sharpless, Rodel Roselle is Goro, and William Guanbosu sings The Bonds. The house lights have dimmed. Donald Runnicles has taken the stage at Walk Festival Hall with the Grand Teton Music Festival Orchestra here in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. This is Giacomo Puccini's Madame Butterfly, Act One.
Certo.
sono il sole, né i miei lo sanno. Io sono
You've just heard Act One of Puccini's Madame Butterfly in performance at the Grand Teton Music Festival. Donald Runnicles led the Grand Teton Festival Orchestra with performing artists Ana Maria Martinez, Christopher Oglesby, Megan Marino, Thomas Lehman, Rodell Russell, and William Guanbo Su. Donald, even though people won't get to hear the rest of the story today, where do things go from here? Well, this is something of a forthcoming attraction. We look forward at some stage to broadcasting Act Two. Let me just describe what we will be hearing one day. Three years have passed since the end of Act One. Butterfly awaits her husband's return at her home. Suzuki prays to the gods for help. Butterfly, however, berates her for believing in lazy Japanese gods rather than in Pinkerton's promise to return one day. Sharpless appears with the letter from Pinkerton. But before he can read it to Butterfly, Goro arrives with the latest suitor, the wealthy Prince Yamadori. Butterfly politely serves the guests tea, but insists that she's not available for marriage. Her American husband has not deserted her. She dismisses Goro and Yamadori. Sharpless again attempts to read Pinkerton's letter and suggests that perhaps Butterfly should reconsider Yamadori's offer. In response, she presents the consul with the young son that she has had by Pinkerton. She says that his name is Sorrow, but when his father returns, he will be called Joy. Sharpless is just too upset to tell her more of the letter's contents. He leaves, promising to tell Pinkerton of the child. A cannon shot in the harbour announces the arrival of a ship. Butterfly and Suzuki take a telescope to the terrace and read the name of the vessel. It is Pinkerton's. Overjoyed, Butterfly joins Suzuki in decorating the house with flowers from the garden. Night falls and Butterfly, Suzuki and the child settle into a vigil watching over the harbour. As dawn breaks and Suzuki insists that Butterfly get some sleep, Butterfly carries the child into the house. Sharpless appears with Pinkerton and Kate, Pinkerton's new wife. Suzuki realises who the American woman is and agrees to help break the news to Butterfly. Pinkerton is overcome with guilt and runs from the scene, pausing to remember his days in the little house. Butterfly rushes in, hoping to find Pinkerton, but sees Kate instead. Grasping the situation, she agrees to give up her son, but insists that Pinkerton return for him. Dismissing everyone, Butterfly takes out the dagger with which her father committed suicide, choosing to die with honour rather than live in shame. She is interrupted momentarily when the child comes in, but Butterfly says goodbye and blindfolds him. An incredibly powerful story, Donald. We agree with Ana Maria Martinez that it still needs to be told. And I also agree with you that we should let our listening audience hear our Act 2 slash 3 at some point. Do you promise that here today? I hereby promise. This has been a presentation of the Grand Teton Music Festival, located in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Live from the Grand Teton Music Festival is a co-production of the Grand Teton Music Festival and Classic Digital Syndications. Victor Munzer is our producer and recording engineer, along with Kevin Harbison. By the way, we would love to hear from you. Write to us or simply send us an email to listener at gtmf.org and by all means come and visit us in the summer in Jackson Hole. For information about the festival visit gtmf.org You can also look for us on our recording label Reference Recordings. I'm Donald Ronicles, And I'm Jeff Counts. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks. <laughs>